introduction to the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phil schempf introduction while touring in southeastern alaska in 1903 i first heard of the remarkable story of metlakatla when in the following summer the call of the northland came upon me again i hied myself to the beautiful village to investigate what sounded like a veritable fairy tale i was cordially received and entertained by mr william duncan and spent a most pleasant summer with him and his people it was then i conceived the idea of becoming the historian of this interesting little nation and the biographer of their wonderful leader with this object in view i have ever since spent all my vacation months in the little village and during the summer just past nineteen o eight i wrote this book under the inspiring sky of metlakatla during these summer months i have had the unspeakable pleasure day after day to listen to the interesting table talks of mr duncan to witness him in his own inimitable dramatic style unrolling word painting after word painting of the many interesting incidents of his life work and thrilling experiences after each one of these interesting talks i made it a point to write down his narrative as nearly as possible in the identical language used by him while everything he had said was still fresh in my memory in the following pages i have faithfully reproduced these his stories from my notebook it is mr duncan who speaks all through them it is he himself who repeats the very words of the action sought to be depicted in these pages every one who knows mr duncan will see him as he is and moves and breathes will hear his voice will recognize his virility that is the merit of the book if it has any i am merely a reporter not an author it is a matter of pride with me that i have made an entirely truthful report and not colored it in any form shape or manner the occasion i have had to draw from the inexhaustible treasure chest of the diaries of mr duncan to examine his correspondence and his books as well as the public records of the colony and all the documents in any way bearing upon any incident has of course been very valuable in enabling me to give the reader the true history of the mission the opportunity i have had through these many moons to study the indians their peculiarities their customs and manners past and present to listen to their tales of past history and life and to their interesting legends i have of course fully availed myself of upon the subject of the contention between bishop ridley and the church missionary society and its representatives on the one side and mr duncan and his people on the other i have attempted to be fair and to give credit where credit was due but i willingly confess that the intense feeling of mr duncan on the subject may unconsciously have colored the glasses through which i myself have observed this regrettable series of incidents still i insist that i have carefully examined all documents bearing upon this untoward strife that i have diligently pursued all that has been written on the subject on both sides and that after weighing judiciously what has been charged and countercharged i can honestly state it as my firm conviction that there is in truth and justice but one side to the case mr duncan may have his faults most of us have he has however fewer than any man i ever met i have not sought to accentuate them neither have i attempted to hide them they have been allowed to crop out in the history of his life without let or hindrance he has kindly permitted me to use for the illustrations of this book a number of photographs taken by him and of which the copies lent me for such purpose are probably now the only ones in existence for this great kindness i thank him mr benjamin a haldane the native photographer at metlakatla mr p e fisher of seattle and mr e a haig of cordova alaska have put me under lasting obligation by allowing me to make use for the same purpose of many photos taken by each of them i cheerfully acknowledge my gratitude to mr james wallace who with great patience during the long winter nights of the past five years has drawn from some of the older natives and faithfully recorded for my use numerous legends of the tsimpsians 
by his painstaking care i have been able to call from a most bounteous supply of fifty or sixty legends some fifteen none of which has ever before appeared in print john w arctander minneapolis end of the introduction chapter one of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf the call of the lord it was a stormy drizzly evening in december eighteen fifty three in the little town of beverley in yorkshire england the windows of st john's church a chapel of ease in the little city were lighted and glittered invitingly out into the dreary darkness but few were abroad in the stormy night to accept the kindly invitation to attend the quarterly missionary meeting to be held that evening in the little chapel in the vestry the vicar of the church the rev a t carr after surveying the scanty audience which had braved the rain and storm suggested to the speaker of the evening the venerable rector of a nearby town that the meeting had perhaps better be adjourned to a more propitious evening but this was not to the taste of the representative of the church missionary society who insisted that those who had come out were entitled to hear the message intended for them perhaps the old evangelical preacher had learned from a long and ardent experience in the master's service that those meetings where only a few earnest and sincere souls who loved the lord sufficiently to brave the wind and the weather to attend were the favorite trysting places of the comforter from heaven be this as it may the old rector was that evening before an audience consisting of perhaps not over thirty souls at his best never had his pleadings for the wants of the missionary fields white and ripe for the harvest and calling in vain for reapers had a more sincere and earnest ring and when he turned his eyes towards heaven and implored god to fill the heart of some young man in that slim congregation with a burning desire to serve his heavenly master in the mission fields his words set the little audience on fire and the prayers of earnest christian men and women were wafted with his to the heavenly realms there was one young man in that audience and only one a friend had the sunday before extended an invitation to him to be present at the meeting he graciously accepted and promised to be there the evening came he looked out the rain and the slush were not very inviting for the long walk from his home but he had promised and he went the service was over alone as he had come the young man went away as he trudged homeward in the storm the thought came to him i was the only young man there why should not i become a missionary may not the lord have something for me to do in heathen lands before he slept that night his mind was made up if god wanted him he would accept the call and bring the glad tidings to some desolate heathen home and hearth the young man was william duncan subsequently the apostle of alaska during the turmoil of the day and in the discharge of his daily duties his resolution grew stronger the day's work over he sought the companionship of one of his best friends stephen hewson a young chemist and while taking a stroll together he confided to his chum the resolve he had made his enthusiasm for the cause must have been contagious for his friend after listening to him exclaimed if you become a missionary i will go with you any one who knows what human sympathy means in the most trying moments of life can appreciate what this promise meant to young duncan and how it would naturally strengthen and clarify him in his purpose and give him assurance of success but we can also easily imagine what shock he must have experienced when he within a day or two learned that his friend moved thereto by the pleadings of a loving mother withdrew his promise so rashly made young duncan also had a loving mother undoubtedly she also pleaded with him not to go away from her not to expose himself to dangers and perils by land and by sea no doubt she was very persistent in her pleadings unless perchance she knew from experience that her son was so constituted that when he saw his duty he did it without regard to consequences and therefore did not strenuously pursue what she well knew would be a useless appeal in any event pleadings of mother and sisters and relatives could not make him recant the resolution of that solemn moment 
in which he had dedicated his life to the master's service in heathen lands neither did the fact that the young resolution of fellowship on the part of his childhood friend had withered by the wayside for one moment lure him from the path he had staked out for himself like his prototype of old the great apostle to the gentiles he could truthfully say at this crucial period of his life as at all other trying and perilous moments which were to follow in coming years this one thing i do undaunted by the desertion of his beloved friend he sought the counsel of his pastor the rev a t carr when he told him of the purpose he had formed he was surprised to hear falling from his lips these words it is strange william but do you know that evening during the service i prayed the lord to put into your heart the desire to devote your life to this very work i feel that this call is from the lord and that you would do wrong not to listen to it his holy name be praised who has heard my prayer another pillar of strength was raised up to our young man in place of the friend who had failed him it was agreed that the pastor should at once communicate with the church missionary society on the subject and offer young duncan services this was done in due time a favorable answer came with the request that duncan himself should address to the society a communication giving his life history the circumstances of his call and an account of the faith in him. End of chapter 1。t of the Apostle of Alaska, the story of William Duncan of Metlakatla, by John W. Arctander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Boy, the Father of the Man this is the proper place to give what account i can of young duncan's history prior to the memorable night mentioned in the preceding chapter that this account is so very scant is due to the innate and extraordinary modesty of mr duncan and his excessive tendency to shrink from any and all publicity in anything concerning his own personality his answer to all requests for something of his personal history is invariably this i do not believe in putting my personality to the front the work is what counts if i by the grace of god have been allowed to accomplish anything for his glory mention the work if you must but leave my personality out i will be glorified saith the lord i have only been an unworthy tool in his hand if an artisan has done a fine piece of work you would praise him and the cunning of his handicraft no one would think of extolling the tool in his hand the place for the tool is on the floor or at best on the bench there i prefer to remain it is the gospel which has done the work as for me i have done nothing i am only the tool in the master's hand let us forget the tool all the most ingenious arguments of the lawyer and of the interviewer simply fell to the ground blunted by the adamant will of the great man this is my excuse for not giving a fuller account of this remarkable man's early history william duncan was born at beverley a city of about twelve thousand inhabitants in yorkshire england some time during the month of april in the year eighteen thirty two even the exact date of his birth is known only to himself and he will not give it it is known that his mother lived to an advanced age and died in the year eighteen ninety eight she is buried at beverley the indians have told me that some years ago he used to show them a plaid which he told them his sister had embroidered a remark that once escaped him of spending some part of his early childhood in the home of his grandmother leads me to believe that his father died when he was very young but who or what he was or what the circumstances and the religious conditions of his parents were i have been unable to learn i take it however that his admission that he had never as a boy taken god's name in vain that he never thought of entering a public house as saloons are called in england that he never until he came of age had tasted any intoxicating liquor and his conduct as a chorister as i hereinafter shall relate all point to the fact that he must have been brought up in a christian home and perhaps under the watchful care of a devoted and praying mother a possible situation which would partially at least explain the wonderful work which he by the grace of god has been allowed to perform a work which i do not hesitate to say has not been equalled on any missionary field in the history of the world by any one man 
an incident in his life happening when he was only seven years old characterizes the man he afterwards was one day he found a penny in his clothes which he could not account for he did not remember that any one had given it to him he knew he had not stolen it how did it come there there came into his mind stories he had heard of people selling themselves to the devil at once the thought occurred to him perhaps the devil had put it there perhaps he wanted to buy him no quicker had this idea come to him than he hurled the penny as far away from him into the tall grass as his tiny hand could send it the devil should have no claims on him when he was nine years old the organist of the great cathedral in the city the beverly minster sent for him to test his voice word had come to him that young duncan was a natural-born singer with a remarkable voice the test was an encouraging and approving one the great musician patted him on the shoulder and told him to appear at the next rehearsal of the vested choir of the minster and from that week till his voice at the age of sixteen failed him young duncan was not only a diligent attendant at all hours for practice and rehearsal as well as at every service in the cathedral but he was soon given the privilege of singing the solo parts of the boy soprano and sang them with such feeling and such artistic skill that according to a publication in the french language which i have had the opportunity to examine people came from long distances to hear his wonderful voice at the divine services in beverly minster of this he was not at all aware in fact so ignorant was he of the unusual charms of his voice and so strongly did he look upon the religious side of his work that he frequently used to get another choir boy with him on saturday afternoons into the outskirts of the town where they would kneel down and join in a prayer to god to help them to sing their parts well the coming sunday so that they could be a help in edifying the congregation and that he might accept their part in that service and worship and help them to render it in the right spirit the only education received by the young man in his childhood outside of the usual course in the common school was one year's instruction mainly in penmanship in a private institution he became an adept as a penman and to this accomplishment he perhaps owed his employment in the office of the house of george cousins and son the owners of a large tannery and wholesale dealers in hides leathers and findings when he was only fifteen years of age his first occupation consisted in making out bills and invoices and copying letters but mr cousins the younger was not slow to discover his latent abilities he taught him bookkeeping soon he was entrusted with the books and cash of the house and before he was eighteen he was engaged as the commercial traveller of the firm in seven or eight of the neighbouring counties he from the start made up his mind to take his religion with him into his business he learned the wants of his customers and made them known to his employers whom he informed that he considered himself the agent of every buyer who could not personally come to the warehouse of the wholesale house if his employers could not comply with the wishes of the buyer he simply cancelled the order and told his employers that this would be his policy all through and that if it did not meet with their approval he would at once quit their service they soon ascertained that it was money in their pocket to let the young erratic salesman have his own way before he had been on the road two years his quarterly trips meant that the stock was completely sold out and the warehouses cleaned out even to the last piece of leather but then he was strictly attending to business no time was wasted and no penny of expense either he was conscientiously aware of the fact that his time belonged to his employers and the only privilege he asked was to return to beverly every week in time to allow him to attend the bible class in st john's church taught by the rev mr carr himself a thoroughly earnest and evangelical preacher to whose church young duncan had attached himself as soon as his relations to the vested choir of the minster had ceased the loss of his voice had made singing out of the question with him for a time but his music-loving soul craved an outlet and it soon found it in a sidious practice on a concertina or accordion which he still has and which he one day with considerable show of affection exhibited to me it seemed to grieve him much to ascertain on trying the old instrument that two of the stops would not work at all i at the same time saw the flute and piccolo which he had played in the days of his youth but which long since had been laid aside for sterner and more practical duties 
an incident of young duncan's experience during his second year as a commercial traveller must be mentioned on his entering the commercial room in the hotel at workshop the head waiter said i suppose you have heard the sad news that our landlord has committed suicide since you were with us last no i have not said mr duncan that is too bad how could the poor man do such a dreadful thing it is a pity to think that a man could commit such a grievous sin as that an aged commercial traveller in the room a well-known agnostic but then unknown to mr duncan put in a word the only one i can think to be pitied is his poor wife she will have a hard row to hoe now as for him if he did not like it here why should he not shuffle off this mortal coil better end it at once than to live in misery but think of his condition in the light to come to meet his creator in that way bah there is no life to come nor any creator for all that it is all bosh grumbled the old traveller are you going to be here to-night sir asked duncan if so i would like to meet you and talk over this matter after i am through with my mail certainly i will be here and will be glad to discuss the matter with you young man after he had seen his customers and made his report to the house young duncan looked up his antagonist and found him at the fireplace in the commercial room and now commenced a battle of giants the old agnostic for a while found the young man's enthusiasm a worthy fence to the blows of his agnostic broadsword but duncan soon discovered that the old infidel with his arguments from Payne and voltaire thoroughly mastered was getting the best of the discussion with the young novice who had not as yet sufficiently studied the apologies of the christian religion finding himself unable to withstand the old infidel's attacks with counter-argument he changed his tactics leaping to his feet he rushed up to his adversary looking him squarely in the eye sir he said you are twice my age you could easily be my father i think you are a gentleman and i will ask you on your honour as a gentleman to answer me truly and honestly from your heart the question i am going to put to you much may depend upon your answer as far as my future is concerned will you answer me truly and honestly and his large blue honest eyes looked anxiously into those of the other man certainly i will young man what do you want to know the question i want to ask you is this here i am a young man i have from my childhood tenderly embraced the christian religion i have grown up in the christian faith have tried to live as near as i could a christian life and have so far enjoyed it i am happy in my christian faith now sir the question i want to ask you and i appeal to your honour to answer it honestly and truly would you advise me to give up this religion this faith this happiness and come over to where you stand without god without faith without hope the old infidel looked as ill at ease as if he had received a blow squarely in the face his eyes sought to escape now one way now another from the pleading searching glances of the young man but finally as in effort to shake off something disagreeable he looked his young antagonist squarely in the face and said while the perspiration beaded his forehead no young man when you put it that way i cannot i will not advise you to drop your religion and faith keep them and be happy but what then do all your arguments of a little while ago amount to don't you see that you are standing on a rotten bridge you are afraid to ask me to come out and stand by your side for fear the rotten thing will not hold us both and will break down i on the other hand stand on a good and solid bridge i can ask you and the whole world to come out and stand at my side without fear that the bridge i stand on will give way when your heart is appealed to instead of your head your honesty compels you to admit that your arguments are only empty words the old infidel wiped the perspiration from his brow and rose to his feet from his lips fell a hesitating good night and without another word he retired from the room the young missionary had preached his first sermon even before the lord had called him to the mission field end of chapter two chapter three of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schampf. speak lord thy servant heareth 
it was understood between young duncan and his pastor the rev mr carr that he should himself on his next trip across the country compose his life story and confession of faith to be sent to the society this he did conscientiously and scrupulously on his return he called on his pastor and submitted to him a rough draft of the communication which met with the full approval of his counsellor on his next trip a fair copy was to be made out and by the pastor forwarded to the proper authorities duncan did his part and returned to beverley late on the night of the tenth of february eighteen fifty four with the communication written out and signed the next evening he would take it over to his pastor and his future would be settled but god willed it otherwise as he in the morning came up the street leading to the office of george cousins and son a man behind him said what are you in such a hurry for mr duncan have you heard that your pastor is dead no not mr carr yes mr carr died suddenly in the pulpit during service last night it was only too true and proved a terrible blow to young duncan mr carr was his valued friend and the only one to whom he could look for counsel and help when he came home that night he placed the letter enclosed in the envelope already addressed to the church missionary society salisbury square fleet street london in his desk he felt then that this blow ended all his ambition to become a missionary and probably looked at it in the light of a divine interposition but herein he was mistaken a couple of months later his uncle who resided in london wrote him that he had suddenly been called to the continent for a prolonged stay and requested him to come up to the city at once to take charge of his rooms papers and other belongings when getting ready for this trip duncan perhaps without any particularly definite intention put the letter to the church missionary society in his pocket after completing the business on which he came to london the idea struck him that he might as well look up the society as long as he was there anyhow he soon found fleet street and looked around just as he expected over there was salisbury square and yes there on a prominent brass plate he discovered in plain letters church missionary society let me go up and look at them was his mental reflection nothing lost i am sure they certainly can't eat me with these words he evidently tried to persuade himself that the call of the lord was not upon him as strong as ever but it was at the door a liveried servant inquired as to his wants is mr chapman in yes sir please take in my card and ask if i may see him in a few moments the servant returned mr chapman wishes to see you sir this way if you please ushered into the secretary's room he was met by a cheerful ah mr duncan glad to see you sir i had expected to hear from you ere this so i intended sir but mr carr died you know yes poor brother carr has gone home it was so sad but he is happier now we wrote him about you and expected an answer from you shortly but received none i know it sir i wrote an answer but as i did not have an opportunity to show the fair copy to my pastor for his approval i thought i would not send it that was too bad too bad oh nothing is lost sir i have it with me you may read it if you wish he read it and was much pleased with its contents and sent him to the principal dr ryan for examination and questioning and before young duncan returned to beverley he was assured that he would soon hear from the society within a week he was informed by the committee that he would be accepted at highbury college for his future training whenever he was ready to report on his return one of his employers told him that there was a rumor in town that two of its young men were going out as missionaries and asked him if he had heard about it yes said mr duncan and i want to tell you that i am one of those young men his employers tried to persuade him not to go and offered him a considerable advance in salary if he would reconsider the matter and remain in their employ knowing duncan as they did they might readily have realized that when his mind was made up as to what he ought to do no arguments or inducements could change it as a matter of fairness he agreed to postpone his departure for six months so as to give them a chance to train another man for his post and with this concession they had to be satisfied 
one evening a few weeks later a gentleman who some years before had filled mr duncan's position with the firm but who was now in the employ of a much larger concern came to his rooms and said that he had heard that mr duncan was going to leave his present employers and offered him what was deemed an extravagant salary if he would enter the employ of his firm he even held out to him the prospect of being admitted as a partner in three or four years what his offer of salary was i do not know for certain but i have been informed by others than mr duncan that to refuse this offer involved a sacrifice of something like five thousand dollars per annum i thank you for your liberal offer sir but i cannot accept it as i have made up my mind to become a missionary said mr duncan a missionary and at what salary may i ask i don't know perhaps a hundred or a hundred and fifty pounds per year <laughs> said the other man to throw yourself away like that you who have one of the keenest business minds in england don't you see you are making a fool of yourself fool or no fool my mind is made up and nothing can change it when the six months were up mr duncan bade farewell to his friends and business associates and buried himself for over two years in highbury college where under the tutelage of dr alford and a select faculty he was thoroughly prepared for his life work so satisfied were his preceptors with the progress he made in his studies that after the lapse of two years it was mooted that he might after another year's study be sent as an instructor to a higher educational institution then maintained by the society in india but this was not to be end of chapter three chapter four of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schampf. a new mission field great britain has always been fortunate in counting among its military and naval officers many men who have not been ashamed to recognize christ as their loving master or to speak a word for him whenever opportunity offered the gordons the havelocks and the headley vickers are not by any means solitary examples of christian soldiery either in the british army or in its navy captain j c prevost a commander in the british navy was a sincere christian gentleman anxious to do his share to make others partakers of the glorious joy with which a living faith had filled his own heart called home to england in the spring of eighteen fifty six after a four years cruise on his majesty's ship virago policing the waters of british columbia extending for a distance of nearly six hundred miles from puget sound to dixon entrance the southern boundary line of what is now american alaska but which was then the alaska of the russians a task which had given him a splendid opportunity to observe the savage but physically splendid type of indians that populated this long coastline and the thousand beautiful islands skirting it the commander had become firmly convinced that if the loving evangel of the saviour of mankind could be preached to these heathen it would be likely to bring far better results as to ending the cruel warfare carried on among the tribes themselves as well as between them and the white men whose trend also on this coast was westward than to send there a whole fleet of warships his heart was full of sympathy for the red man of the northwest coast to whose villages no protestant missionary had so far found his way though the white people ever since the discovery and survey of the coast by captain vancouver in seventeen ninety two had maintained most profitable trade relations with them the curse of civilization in the form of rum debauchery and loathsome disease had readily penetrated to the farthest villages while the peace-bringing message of the white christ had during all these years been withheld from them captain prevost pressed upon the church missionary society the necessity of taking up this new mission field and called their attention to the fact that fort simpson a fortified trading station of the hudson's bay company directly south of the russian boundary line and which he had visited with his ship just about the time of the memorable missionary meeting in beverly herein described would furnish a well-nigh perfect naval base for a new mission both because around it were located numerous villages of the most intelligent tribe of the natives on the coast the tsimsheans 
and because they being the traders of the region in their turn were the intermediaries between the whites and other indians as well as between the indians of the coast and those of the interior the officers of the society were strongly impressed with the appeals of the christian naval officer but regretfully had to inform him that it was impossible for them to open any new field of missionary labor because of the total lack of funds for such purpose they offered him however the privilege of the columns of their organ the christian missionary intelligencer for an appeal to the public for funds for the new mission which he had urged should be commenced among the northwest coast indians it goes without saying that captain prevost gratefully accepted this offer and an eloquent article from his pen describing the indians their savage state their intellectual possibilities and physical excellencies and holding up to the readers the reproach to the nation of having for more than seventy years withheld from these tribes the blessings of the gospel while showering over them the curses of civilization appeared in the july number eighteen fifty six of the society's publication this appeal was not made in vain a month later the society could give the gratifying information that in response to the captain's pleading two anonymous friends had contributed twenty five hundred dollars for the proposed mission among the northwest coast indians one hindrance thus was removed but another remained the society did not have the proper missionary to send again and again the subject was canvassed at the meetings of the committee they could not find the man then came another visit of captain prevost he called to inform them that he had been reappointed to his old station on the pacific coast and would sail in a fortnight and what was more important still that he had obtained the permission of the admiralty to carry in his ship on its trip around the world to victoria any missionary whom the society might conclude to send to the indians on the northwest coast again the committee was called together where could they find the proper man this mission required a man of undaunted courage of well-nigh indomitable determination and will-power of unlimited faith in god and of good sound judgment as the entire management of the mission would practically devolve upon him alone without the aid of the council and direction of the society or its committee again and again did they scan the lists of available candidates only to arrive at the same disheartening conclusion then some one modestly whispered the name of duncan 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 he is the man they all agreed but will he go on wednesday evening dr alford sat in his study in highbury college young duncan had been sent for he soon approached the president of the college who contemplated him with loving eyes duncan he said pointing to a map hanging on the wall to a point away up near the northwestern extremity of the american continent the society contemplates opening a mission at this point among one of the most savage tribes of the indians of the northwest coast but as any missionary sent there will have to take his life in his hands and perhaps will never return it does not feel like taking the responsibility of sending any one there unless he would practically volunteer his services your name has been suggested will you go i will go wherever i am sent sir was the instant response but the missionary who goes must sail by next tuesday do you think you could get ready on such short notice i can go in an hour if it is necessary sir dr alford had not been mistaken in his man the answer showed the stern stuff of which the intended missionary was made god bless you duncan he said much affected i honestly believe that you will go and return again hale and hearty in spite of all the dangers whether i will ever return sir will be the lord's business going is mine i am ready to do my part and i am sure we can trust the good lord to do his on friday afternoon duncan took his leave of the college with the commission of the society for the fort simpson mission in his pocket there were perhaps some misgivings because he was prevented from finishing his course of study and had thus to be sent away without graduating but the committee felt that in this case necessity knew no law and so far departed from the rules the same evening saw duncan at the store of the outfitters where he gave his order for a complete outfit including even a shovel an axe a saw a rake and a hoe besides numerous tools for carpentering and blacksmithing 
sunday was spent in beverly bidding farewell to the relatives and friends of a young lifetime on monday morning he sped away on the express train to london where he was to receive his final instructions at the society's office before departing for plymouth in the london streets he was caught in one of the inevitable jams which sometimes suspend all traffic for hours and hours but undaunted he sprang from his cab portmanteau in hand wormed his way through the crowded streets on foot and succeeded in reaching salisbury square just as the secretary was about to leave his office then off he hied to paddington station where he found the van of the outfitters with his twenty-eight pieces of luggage large and small and also his best friend among the students at the college a mr trot who had come to say the last good-bye a few moments before seven o'clock a cab rolled up and to duncan's surprise out stepped dr alford who had concluded to go with him to plymouth in order to see him safely on board tickets purchased the two are soon on their way to plymouth tuesday morning before seven the train pulled into plymouth station the travellers disembarked and went to the harbour there in the roadstead impatiently tugging at her anchor with steam up ready to speed away from old england on her six months cruise lay his majesty's ship satellite a spick and span new corvette with twenty-one heavy armstrong guns aboard went dr alford and mr duncan and his twenty-eight pieces of luggage to stow away which gave the executive officer of the ship more trouble than anything else just then dr alford remained on board all forenoon as he desired to say to captain prevost a last word in behalf of his young friend but finally had to depart as the captain tarried longer than expected at two p m on december twenty third eighteen fifty six captain prevost boarded his vessel and half an hour later the ship was under way and steamed out of the harbour the young missionary stood alone by himself on its deck but strange to say when old england's coast slowly receded and the fog banks caressing it he did not even for one moment look back at what he left behind untrammelled by any ties of kinship and friendship fancy free and heart whole his dancing courageous blue eyes looked forward where the prow of the ship was ploughing the waves into the future fraught with danger into the holy sacrifice of all comforts of home and home life into the awful solitude and the absence of all human sympathy into the life work which was to be his under god to do forward and then upward were his eyes directed then a smile as of heavenly assurance came into his blue eyes spread over the ruddy cheeks and around the curves of the firm mouth and disappeared in the curly sandy locks with which the wind played he went away with god on his errand under the protection of the almighty loving father this one thing i do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward unto those things which are before i press towards the mark End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 of the Apostle of Alaska, the story of William Duncan of Metlakatla by John W. Arctander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schampf. Aboard the Man of War it had been the understanding of the committee that the young missionary should be given the privilege of the captain's cabin on the voyage it was perhaps with this in view that he was warned not to let the luxuries and comforts of the voyage weaken him for the many hardships that perhaps would be his when he reached the end of his journey but as it was the committee need have borrowed no trouble on this account when the captain came aboard duncan was for the first time informed that inasmuch as a prominent divine and his family were to be passengers as far as the island of madeira he would until their departure from the ship have to put up with the quarters between decks and be transferred to the engineer's mess for his fare the quarters for sleeping were not over sumptuous a hammock slung on the middle deck so high that when the young missionary the first night started to retire unused as he was to accommodations of that sort he went on his head right over his bed with a rather more hurried than dignified movement he soon learned however the trick required to land in his hammock instead of on the floor and had no fault to find with his quarters 
not so however was the engineer's mess where he was to take his meals the second engineer was an uncouth rowdyish fellow and could not speak ten words in sequence without ripping out an oath or other sacrilegious expression duncan bore it as long as he could but at last he reported the matter to the captain who after he had investigated the complaint found it true and again transferred the missionary this time to the gunner's mess he soon found that he had almost fallen from the frying pan into the fire the chief gunner was glum and morose ugly and cross so that to sit down to table with him would naturally make one feel as if he were attending his own funeral but as long as he was not condemned to listen to blasphemy and sacrilege duncan felt he could stand it for a while the worst was that the captain seemed to have entirely forgotten his promise the sick vicar and his family were landed at madeira but no one thought of inviting duncan to the captain's cabin tiring of the gloomy company at table he at the first landing of the ship in rio janeiro purchased a sack of rusks every morning thereafter he filled a little pocket flask with water put some rusks in his coat pocket and with a book for a companion retired to the privacy of the little dinghy dangling in its davits over the stern of the vessel here he spent his days for his food munching the dry toasted rusks and for liquid refreshment sipping the water until evening came when he retired to his hammock on the middle deck at valparaiso he replenished his supply of rusks and for three months and over he lived on bread and water rather than submit to the indignities offered him at table on her majesty's warship when the ship left Kalao, to which place it had brought a number of supernumeraries for his majesty's squadron stationed near that point the ship's doctor a kindly christian gentleman and the only one aboard who had paid any marked attention to the young missionary on behalf of the officers invited him to take his meals at the officers mess but this he declined to do and it was only by the most persistent urging that he was about a month before the ship reached victoria induced to abandon his bread and water diet and eat at the officers table on learning of this change in the program even the captain's memory seems to have been jogged and he now sent for mr duncan and invited him to come into his cabin but duncan who had learned to like his modest surroundings asked to be excused using as a pretext that his clothes were stowed away somewhere where he could not get at them and that under the circumstances he preferred to be where he was and where he now felt perfectly at home it follows of itself that he could not during all this time remain inactive in his master's service only a short time out of england he organized a bible class among the blue jackets and had the satisfaction of seeing it grow both in numbers and in interest until upon the landing in victoria it numbered not less than twenty-five young tars it would naturally be supposed that young duncan would find a genial companion in the chaplain of the ship but not so this worthy and dignified representative of the church of england if i am correctly informed deemed it proper to pay no attention whatever to the lowly lay missionary who without receiving holy orders from the church dared go to bring the glad message of salvation to the poor savages on the northwest coast after a tedious voyage of nearly six months the satellite dropped anchor in Eskimalt harbor near victoria on the thirteenth day of june eighteen fifty seven end of chapter five chapter six of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schampf. the inside passage victoria now one of the most beautiful and interesting cities on the pacific coast located on a rock-strewn inlet near the southeastern extremity of the magnificent vancouver island which for a distance of nearly three hundred miles skirts the west coast of british columbia was when mr duncan first landed there an insignificant hamlet with less than two hundred inhabitants but nevertheless possessed of some importance partly because it was practically the only white settlement north of the straits of juan de fuca but especially because here was located the headquarters for the great northwest territory of the powerful hudson's bay company 
at the fort in victoria duncan was officially received by the governor of the company sir james douglas one of the truly great men of western canada in order to allow him to begin his work at fort simpson it was necessary to secure the consent of this autocrat of the coast without that he would not even be accepted as a passenger on the company's steamer then the only means of communication between the northland and civilization this consent the governor was loath to give he insisted that the society had done a positive wrong in sending a missionary to the indians without first consulting the company's officers inasmuch as they were the only ones who knew and appreciated the true condition of things if i should allow you to go to fort simpson it would be just the same as to send you to your certain death this company cannot undertake to be responsible for your safety under the circumstances and does not want to become a party to your murder why not remain here we have thousands of indians near victoria who need a missionary and we will give you all the aid in our power if you will direct your efforts toward their conversion and civilization the trouble is mr governor that i am sent to fort simpson and to fort simpson i must go if i cannot go there i must return unless you can secure from the society a change in my orders which i do not think you can and to tell you the truth i would not myself very much favor any such action but young man knowing the situation as i do i feel sure you will not last up there three months it is all your life is worth to go among those savages and bloodthirsty indians you will do no good but you will make us eternally regret it if anything should happen to you which it most certainly will when mr duncan insisted that he must nevertheless go and stated that all he desired was permission to stay in the fort until he had learned the language after which time he would go out and shift for himself without any responsibility for his safety on the part of the company the governor finally yielded with this remark well young man if you are to be killed and eaten i suppose you are the one most vitally interested after all and we will have to take a back seat the governor who could not fail to appreciate the pluck courage and determination of the young missionary from that moment became his staunch friend and in after years on more than one occasion gave valuable proofs of his appreciation of mr duncan's wonderful work but victoria was nearly six hundred miles from fort simpson and the steamer which went north only twice a year in the spring and autumn had but a short time before started for the northland there was therefore nothing for mr duncan to do but to remain in victoria for the next three or four months this time he spent by invitation at the rectory of christ's church with the rev edward cridge who some years before had come out from england as chaplain to the fort accompanied by his young and amiable wife young duncan during this enforced vacation became the leader and instructor of the young ladies choir of the church and also conducted services for mr cridge every sunday afternoon in a small settlement some miles from the village he immediately proceeded to make himself familiar with the chinook language a trading jargon invented by one of the company's agents to enable to some limited extent interchange of ideas with the different indians of the coast who all spoke different tongues later on he managed to find a Timpsian indian who came to him an hour every day and from him he began to acquire some knowledge of the language of the tribes among whom he was to work but in a few weeks this indian was off for his home and the lessons were interrupted he arrived at fort simpson a month or two before duncan and told the indians about his intended coming assuring them that they would like him as he was their friend and in this way to some extent prepared the way for duncan though he himself never lived to see the wonderful change which was to come over his people as he died within a month after the arrival of mr duncan at the fort from a gunshot wound received during a drunken brawl the enforced delay was anything but pleasing to mr duncan but even that proved to be of great benefit to him in the future while in victoria his inviting and frank manner and his earnest christian zeal gained him the brotherly love and warm friendship of rector later bishop cridge and also the esteem of the hon w j macdonald who some years later was appointed life senator of the dominion senate at ottawa from the new province of british columbia the friendship of these two men in his coming hour of trial and tribulation 
proved to him the greatest boon which he possibly could have obtained god only knows where he would have been to-day and what would have become of the permanent fruits of his life work had it not been for the support and strength which these god-fearing men standing high in the councils of the province and the nation so unstintedly gave to him in his hour of sorest need finally the hour of release came on the twenty-fifth day of september eighteen fifty seven he bade his many new-found friends in victoria a cordial farewell as he was about to speed northward and westward on the company steamer the otter and now there was in store for him a wonderful treat for five days he sailed through the inlets and fjords passages reaches and channels the one more beautiful and wonderful than the other where the shifting scenery in its solitary grandeur enchanted the eye and charmed the soul from earliest morn to the latest dusk the first day out it looked as though the steamer was running right ashore suddenly just as the prow almost touched the rocks an inlet opened to the right the helm was swung hard starboard and the vessel slipped in as between the hugging banks of a river then with just as sudden a turn to port through the swirls and tide ripples of active pass out into the gulf of georgia where in the wide sapphire blue expanse between the snow-clad peaks of vancouver island and the distant selkirk range on the mainland he could occupy his time all day long by watching the antics of playing and spouting whales now the ship enters discovery passage narrow dangerous though interesting especially so near its centre the renowned seymour narrows or yakulta as the natives call them the home of the evil spirits where the tide races through at a speed varying from eight to twelve knots an hour many a ship has here been caught in the swirling currents and hurled against the knife-edged reef in the centre of the channel only to sink with all on board into the depths of over one hundred fathoms close by no ship at that time dare pass through these dreaded narrows the maelstrom of the northwest coast except on a slack tide and in full daylight and even to the present day the largest steamers dread the seymour narrows and tremble in the embrace of the giant current and the tide ripples as if they were alive and throbbing with fear at cape mudge the young missionary saw the first totem pole the strange carved monument peculiar to the north coast indians but some distance farther on a more horrible sight awaited him as the steamer approached fort rupert at the northeast end of vancouver island dismembered and disemboweled human bodies were seen strewn all over the beach of a nearby island a few days before a haida canoe had come to trade with the fort rupert indians some slight breach of etiquette on the part of the visitors brought on their devoted heads the rage of the local indians they said nothing at the time save to nurse their wrath but when the time for departure came a large party had preceded the haidas laid in wait for them at an island near the fort where they knew they would camp for the night and killed every one in the party except two young men one of them the son of a haida chief who were made slaves and there the dead bodies mangled and mutilated were allowed to lie scattered over the beaches of the passage as a proof of the prowess of the slayers this was not a very encouraging sight to meet the eye of the young missionary enough perhaps to make many a weak-hearted man turn back in fear and disgust but not so our young man this one thing i do his eyes said it is well that we are soon in queen charlotte sound where the swell of the great north pacific and the storms of this misnamed ocean can brush from our disgusted brows the memories of cruel bloodshed as the steamer for a distance of thirty miles is passing in the open with no protection from the mountainous isles of the columbian archipelago but before long the ship steers by a mountain crag nearly four thousand feet in height into what looks like a mighty smooth river running between mountain banks the fitzhugh sound then it turns to the west through the beautifully wooded way called lama passage then through the narrow confines of plumper channel and after a few miles sail in the open again the way goes by the quaint-looking china hat past its indian village and phantom-like graveyard through finlayson's channel then we pass into tolmy channel where the throbbing of the engine echoes back from the nearby mountain cliffs 
and into the highish narrows where the pines on the slope seem to elongate themselves down in the mirror-like waters and where the wash of the waves from the steamer against the shores not farther away on either side than one could toss a biscuit awakens the slumbering eagles who have rested on the topmost branches of the highest trees and now soar in daring flight towards the azure heavens above then the reaches fraser graham and mckay one more beautiful and enchanting than the other the steep forest-clad mountain ranges hardly a quarter of a mile apart the deep still waterways the snow-clad crags the tracks of snow slides and of rock slides the hanging valleys and the noisy waterfalls sometimes dancing down from the very highest peaks for thousands of feet in one uninterrupted leap in their turn each appeal to the eye and then there is the wonderful grenville channel perhaps the most magnificent of them all where for nearly fifty miles one course is held without change and the ship glides almost noiselessly through the glassy sea and past a panoramic splendor which finds adequate expression only in the use of the most extravagant superlatives such as the wonderful inside passage of the northwest coast where the largest ships of the world can safely pass and the grandest scenery on the globe throws open at every turn its shifting vistas to the wondering and admiring gaze of all who have been fortunate enough to obtain an admission ticket to this god's own show-place where man has done nothing and nature everything where nature's god speaks to the heart in the strange beauty of the great solitude the nirwana of the wonderful northland we do not wonder that sailing through this magnificent and majestic scenery our young missionary read the wonderful handwriting of the master of the sea and sky and land it was in the black darkness of a northern winter night on the first of october eighteen fifty seven that the otter dropped anchor outside fort simpson the whistle of the steamer created a stir in the fort and in the huts of the indians on the beach as well the first sight which duncan obtained of his future charges was in the glare of firebrands running back and forth on the beach with the captain and the representative of the company he was admitted to the fort soon after the arrival of the steamer for a social call but as no quarters had been provided for him he returned to the steamer for the night we can rest assured that tired though he was he did not before seeking his couch that night forget to kneel down and implore the almighty's blessing on the work he had come to do in his name and by his grace end of chapter six chapter seven of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w r tander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf at the fort the hudson's bay company's fort at port simpson was built in eighteen thirty four near the beach of a sheltered bay east of dixon's entrance not far from the boundary line of what was then russian alaska but which in eighteen sixty seven was to become american alaska the illustration on an adjoining page is from a photograph taken by a metlakatla native benjamin a haldane of an oil painting by gordon lockerby painted from watercolor sketches taken of the fort and its surroundings in eighteen sixty three and it in mr duncan's opinion gives a fairly good idea of the fort its location and surroundings as they looked when he on the morning after his arrival had an opportunity to first observe them the walls of the fort consisted of palisades thirty-two feet high built of trunks of trees over two feet in diameter driven into the ground and solidly riveted together the double gate was iron-bound and bolted and in it was a smaller gate similarly protected at which a sentinel or doorkeeper was stationed night and day and through which under the rules of the company not more than two indians at any one time were admitted so great was the fear of the inmates of the fort of the savagery of the natives at the four corners of the palisades which enclosed a space two hundred and forty feet square were built bastions two of which were provided with cannon able to sweep the surrounding country in all directions 
inside of the palisades about four feet below the top of the wall was a gallery running all around the fort so as to enable an armed guard to march back and forth and command a free view of the surrounding country on all sides of the structure night and day within the fort were located the company's store and its immense warehouse where thousands of valuable furs obtained by barter from the indians at ridiculously low prices were kept the captain's residence where the mess room for the officers was located a smaller building for the second officer and visitors where mr duncan soon after his arrival was installed in two small rooms there were also a carpenter shop a blacksmith shop and a large building containing five rooms for the garrison of the fort which besides the three officers consisted of twenty workmen mostly french canadians these men were paid the magnificent salary of twenty-five cents per day and rations they were all married to or at least living with indian women and four of the families were stowed away in one room each family living in one corner and doing its cooking at the common fireplace in the centre of the room the walls of the fort have now and for many years past been raised and the only remnants of the old fort now standing are the captain's residence and the company's storehouse the latter has now been converted into the new company store and the front of the building modernized but the side wall of the storehouse still remains in the identical condition in which it was when mr duncan first saw it when the fort was first built there was no indian village close by the tsimshean indians or at least the tribes which later took up their abode around the fort were then located at metlakatla some seventeen miles southeast from the fort the word tsimshean means in the skeena by which it is meant to express the people living along or on the banks of the skeena river and this name correctly records an historical fact for these tribes many generations ago had lived at different points along the banks of the skeena river the name of each tribe as hereafter detailed gives to those acquainted with the topography of the country and the language the exact original location of all of them when the fort had been located at port simpson the indian tribes who had lived at metlakatla were induced to take down their houses and rebuild them in the immediate vicinity of the fort and when duncan arrived there were located around the fort nine tribes with a population of twenty three hundred living in one hundred and forty houses to the left of the fort is shown the village of kilutsas the people living inside to the right is a portion of the village of the kishpokalots the people of the land of the elderberries the high pole in front of the last house to the right is the totem pole of legaic the principal chief of this tribe and in fact the head chief of the tsimtsians immediately beyond the confines of this village was situated a large peninsula at high tide an island on the shores of which were located the other villages one following in order after the other all around the island the kitnakangeeks the people who live where there are lots of mosquitoes the kittendoas the people of the land of the poles the kitsaklaws the people of the canyon the kitlans the people of the island the kitnatowicks the people of the rapids literally where the water runs swiftly the kitsish the people of the land of the hair seal traps and the kitwilgeants the people of the last place down besides these there were five tribes of tsimtsians living up the nass river some forty-five miles north of the fort and three tribes had settled on the coast farther south the only one of these tribes which will prove of any interest to us as this story proceeds is the tribe of the kithronthlas the people of the salt water which live along brown's passage away out in the ocean the houses of the indians were all one-story affairs built on poles or piles on the beach fifteen or twenty feet above high tide one house almost contiguous to the next and none of them provided with windows most of them were however of quite liberal dimensions some of the chief's houses being fifty or fifty-five by sixty-five feet the framework consisted of heavy logs posts and beams two or three feet in diameter upon the large beams rested the rafters of the roof which came to a peak part of these rafters for a distance of five or six feet extending out over the beams at the end of them was fastened a plank against which the walls made of split cedar planks rested 
the roof was made of big slabs of bark which were held in position by stones placed upon them there was only one room in each house around the walls ran an elevated platform used for storing away edibles and treasure chests as well as for sleeping purposes in the centre was a large deep oblong space sometimes dug down into the earth here was the huge fireplace with its blazing logs and directly above it an opening in the roof to allow the smoke to escape and to furnish whatever ventilation was needed it goes without saying that in a cold winter there was plenty of it in fact i have been told that a person sitting close up to the fireplace was fairly toasted on one side while the other was white with frost in order to furnish a windbreak planks were placed on the roof in proximity to this hole and in such a way that they could be moved to correspond with the direction of the wind it was in this central portion of the house that the family spent the day when not engaged outside often such a house would be the home of from thirty to forty people each one of the tribes of these savages had its own chiefs usually four or five one of whom was more prominent than the others these chiefs came from the scovalis or royal blood no one could be a chief unless he on his mother's side descended from the scovalis of the tribe in the case of the total extinction of the scovalis family the wise men of the tribe would elect one of their number to be the founder of another dynasty then there were the ligaquets forming the aristocracy of the tribe and from whom the headmen or counsellors of the chiefs usually from ten to twelve came these men obtained their official rank and standing by the liberal giving away of property rather than by reason of their birth then we have the wahimes or the common people in addition to these castes or classes there was also to be found in each tribe a number of slaves klingungits either prisoners of war or obtained by barter and trade from other tribes the male slaves ha were doing the hunting and fishing and all other hard work for the chiefs and the aristocracy and the females wotek were performing all menial work required around the camp these slaves were treated very cruelly and often killed at the bidding of their masters it has been stated that legaic was the head chief of the tsimsheans at fort simpson this does not indicate that he ruled over any other tribe than his own each tribe had absolute control of its own village but when the head men of the different tribes for any purpose met together in common council or attended a great feast legaic who by reason of his having given away more property than any other chief ranked above the others took the most prominent seat and greater attention was paid to his words only to this extent did his head chiefship go before mr duncan had been at the fort a week it was this chief who a little after high noon enraged at what he considered a lack of recognition of his rank on the part of a couple of chiefs of one of the other tribes in order to show the indians his power and daring shot an unarmed indian a visiting haida just as he was about to enter the gate of the fort and left him there wounded and dying not even satisfied with this wanton deed of cruelty he ordered two of his slaves to take their guns and go finish the fellow so thoroughly impregnated with fear of the savagery of the tribes were the inmates of the fort that not one of the garrison dared to go outside to aid or rescue the wounded man the officers of the fort without interfering or protesting at all from the gallery witnessed the killing of the wounded man by legaic slaves looking more like incarnate devils than human beings they crawled over the wood piles in front of the fort and in cold blood discharged their shotguns into the body of the bleeding and dying victim this scene of bloodthirstiness and savage cruelty was mr duncan's introduction to his future wards enough surely it was to discourage the bravest heart but to him it only gave a stronger determination to bring to these people the message of the gospel of peace and mercy this one thing i do was still his motto his practical mind had already told him that the only way to get to the heart of these savages was to bring them the gospel message in their own tongue and that the first step for him to take was to learn this barbaric language without a grammar without a dictionary yea even without an alphabet in as short a time as possible he ascertained that no one at the fort understood the language even the captain who had married a native woman got along with the trading jargon but the chinook jargon could not be used for preaching the gospel that was certain 
within a couple of days of his arrival mr duncan on the advice of the captain and with his assistance secured for his teacher of the language a young ligaket from legaic's tribe one claw who occasionally came into the fort and who had impressed every one with his apparent greater intellectuality than the common ordinary indian but claw understood no english and duncan hardly knew a word of tsimshean both could however make use of the chinook jargon and when that failed they had to resort to the sign language mr duncan had from his dictionary made a list of fifteen hundred of the most common and useful words in the english language now his first task was to get the meaning of these words in tsimshean and to write them down phonetically as they were pronounced by claw the difficulty was not so great while the objects of the words were at hand or within reach and could be pointed out as a house a man a nose an eye a chair a table etc but when it came to words beyond that pale the ingenuity of mr duncan was frequently taxed to the utmost in the attempt to make himself understood when i in the summer of nineteen o eight interviewed old claw who is still living at port simpson i was told by him yes mr duncan teach me english and me teach him tsimshean this mutual teaching perhaps helped matters some as mr duncan after a while could express himself in english at least in the preparatory efforts to explain the expression he was after especially must the limited advance of his teacher into the mysteries of the english language have been of some assistance to him when he sought to learn the tsimshean expressions for some twelve hundred short sentences which he had formed in english but after all the task was appalling he says himself that many a time did he spend half a day in obtaining the proper words for a single idea lacking as the tsimshean language naturally is in many expressions greatly valuable in preaching the gospel it has for instance no word for spiritual or carnal nor anything that expresses either of these ideas there are in other respects a superabundance of expressions almost inexplicable to us they have for instance not less than five different words for each numeral depending on whether one speaks of flat objects like blankets or books or of round objects like dollars or of men and women or of canoes or of long objects like guns trees nails etc two for instance in tsimshean when applied to blankets is topra when applied to dollars kupa to men tupa duel to canoes kalbelk and to guns kuapskan adjectives are entirely different words when applied to the singular and to the plural nouns also in other respects is the language intensely complicated words of ten and twelve syllables are not uncommon one page in english could not be properly translated into tsimshean in much less than two here is an example the expression may you be forever happy is one word in tsimshean klatum vila lua mam ka chumga not very remarkable for its compactness and brevity i am sure one illustration of the tireless efforts of mr duncan to acquire the language must here be given he wanted to get the expression in tsimshean for the word try he first took a slate and wrote in big letters kla and showed him the writing then he rubbed out what he had written handed the slate pencil to claw and pointed to the slate claw who could not write shook his head try try with many gestures more shaking of the head then he took claw's hand and guided it so that he with duncan's help wrote claw then pointing to the word written pronouncing it and to the blank space below and handing him the pencil he again repeated try try a light of understanding now came into claw's eyes as he took hold of the pencil he exclaimed tumpaldo tumpaldo ah said duncan who wanted to be sure that he got it right running over to the fireplace he grabbed hold of a heavy log lying there pretended to attempt to lift it and being unable to do so crying all the time while looking anxiously at claw tumpaldo tumpaldo ah ah was the answer ah is tsimshean for yes ein for no he had found it tumpaldo means i will try just as amo in latin means i love 
the first person singular is expressed by the terminal o while mr duncan is working day and night and burning the midnight oil in efforts to acquire the language we will devote a few chapters to learning something about the tsimshean indians their manners customs and religion for they had a religion before duncan came among them primitive and crude it is true but nevertheless containing in its legendary lore thoughts which should make it much easier for them to embrace the wonderful truths which he had come to teach them End of chapter 7。Tsimsheans North of Vancouver Island, the Coast Indians of British Columbia were, in 1857, the Quakutl, the Begula, the Tsimsheans, and the Haidas. North of Dixon Entrance, in Russian Alaska, were the Tlingits and some tribes of Haida descendants. The Indians of the interior were called the Stikin, or Tinnes, up around the Yukon were the Athabascans. All the coast Indians are far in advance of the plain Indians of the United States and Canada they have not the roving disposition nor the nomadic habits of these indians they are as a rule industrious frugal imitative and self-supporting and have never been objects of governmental charity of all these indian peoples the tsimshean nation ranks the highest with the haidas a close second while these different nations have many peculiarities in common especially the totem institution which hereafter will be fully described their language and even their make-up and characteristics are so different that it is evident that they do not spring from the same source and perhaps do not even originally hail from the same country where the tsimsheans originally came from it is impossible to ascertain some have thought they could find points of contact between them and the new zealanders others have believed that they could discover among them traces of the peculiarities of the ancient aztecs of mexico those who associate them even in the distant past with the japanese or the koreans certainly do not find any very good arguments for their contention they perhaps drifted northward long ago from some tropical island in the pacific i have been told that a legend the details of which now seem to be forgotten speaks of a beautiful island in the sea which one day suddenly sank under the waves in other words another atlantis in the pacific ocean one of their many different legends about the flood also particularly accentuates that before they were dispersed and driven away by the great flood they lived in a beautiful country with lovely sunshine fine large trees and gorgeous flowers the following legend related by adolphus calvert of metlakatla may point to a warmer climate where the sun seemed nearer or to a knowledge of the story of the tower of babel or both i give it in this connection for what it is worth in ages long ago the heavens were much nearer the earth than now the people were afraid to disturb the great chief so they only talked in whispers a tsimshean chief had a son who was a great thinker he thought very much over all the troubles from which his people suffered and he wanted to help them in those troubles one night he stayed out in the woods all night and saw away up into the heavens then he knew much more than he ever did before next day he commenced to make arrows and kept on at this till he had over a thousand arrows then one clear day he shot an arrow into the heavens with such force that it moved them a little higher then he shot another hit the first one right on the head and pushed the heavens still further away then they were so far away that he could not shoot so far he then called upon the people and they carried rocks to a small island high above the sea there they piled the rocks upon the highest peak so he went up on top of the rocks and shot some more arrows until the heavens were moved clear out of sight then the people were glad because now they could make all the noise they wanted to without disturbing the great chief and making him angry wherever the tsimsheans may have come from originally we certainly find that they must already have lived on the coast south of the skeena when captain cook visited these regions in seventeen seventy eight or perhaps even earlier than that 
at the visit of captain baring in seventeen forty one or during the cruise of the spanish warships in seventeen seventy four as one of the traditionary legends of the tsimsheans related to mr duncan by the kilt rotlus gives the following account of the first visit of the whites to the coast which plainly refers to one of the warships of one of the several expeditions here mentioned one day when my grandfather was a small boy four people from our village went out fishing for halibut there was a great fog and nothing could be seen when their lines were all down they suddenly heard a strange noise coming from the sea but the fog was so thick they could not discover anything they thought it was some great sea monster coming in from the sea up to the shore where the village was so they pulled up their lines and paddled to the shore to tell their people to look out for the sea monster when they came near the shore the fog lifted and then they saw a big round monster swimming in the sea trees were growing out of its back and heads of men were hung on the branches of the trees then a baby monster came out of the belly of the big sea monster and there were the heads of many white ghosts sticking up from the back of it and they had long sticks and they pushed the water back with them so the baby monster flew towards the shore when it came to the beach the white ghosts lifted up the sticks and the tears of the salt water crawled down the sticks and fell in the water with a great drip drip then the white ghosts went on shore when the indians saw them they were afraid but the white ghosts pointed to their halibut and the indians gave them one and they cut it up and threw the pieces in a round black box they then wanted fire and an indian brought two sticks to make a fire with and commenced to rub them together but the white ghosts laughed and one of them took a little dry grass and something from his pocket and made a big noise and a flash and fire came right away in the wood when the indians saw that they all died then they put the black box right on to the fire and it did not burn up but the halibut was cooked then the indians died again after that the white ghosts emptied a sack of maggots in the kettle after a while they take the maggots out and put them in a dish and then they pour over the maggots the grease of dead people then they want the indians to eat the maggots and the grease but the indians run away behind the rocks then the white ghosts eat the maggots and the grease themselves when they sit and eat a goose flies over their heads then a white ghost takes a long stick and points it at the goose then there is a big noise and a small smoke and the goose falls down and is dead when the indians see that they die again but the chief and his slaves now come down to the beach and the chief was painted black and red and he stood up right before the white ghosts and he looks wild at them and the blood of many men makes his eyes very red and when the white ghosts see his red eyes then the white ghosts die and when the chief dances and sings the war song and sings very hard and high then the white ghosts die again the native who told mr duncan this story desired to impress on him the contrast between the first visit of the whites to their home and the visit of mr duncan at which later event he said that none of the indians died many stories could be told from the traditions of the tsimsians of their cruel wars with the indians of the interior wherein their chief trakats thunder seems to have proven especially valiant and successful and of their battle with the alaska indians who were finally driven back across dixon entrance never to show themselves again except for the peaceful purposes of trade also of their warfare with the nass indians which seems to have terminated in eighteen twenty nine by a drawn wager of battle between two chosen representatives of the contending tribes in which duel the tsimsheans were victorious and by which the feud between them was settled but we must hasten on to more interesting topics End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of the Apostle of Alaska The Story of William Duncan of Metlakatla by John W. Arctander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Mode of Living Now must be told how these people lived at the time the gospel first came to them the spring and summer was their work time the long winter months were mostly devoted to fun and frolic feasts and gambling potlatches dances and medicine work about which more anon and two now and then a murder they had for years been the traders of the coast 
the furs of the interior which before the white people came they used to cover their nakedness with when they deemed it necessary to cover it at all they bartered from the inland indians to whom they in turn furnished food dried and smoked fish and the wonderful ulacan oil in large enough quantities to last them all winter if they had furs enough for nothing was given without the proper equivalent and perhaps a little more it is said that in trading their women always had the deciding word and that they could always be relied upon to make clever bargains and this in a day when there was no bargain counters around after the whites came to fort simpson the hudson's bay company blankets took the place of the furs for covering their bodies but only with this difference in the trading that they bartered furs so obtained from the indians to the hudson's bay company for blankets and other of the white man's goods which they could use they did not permit the interior indians to trade directly with the company at all insisting on their right to act as middlemen and great are the bargains they sometimes made if reports are true but that was necessary if they would hold their own with the company which cheated them woefully in paying for their furs there was no currency at the coast until the whites came when the company's two-point blankets became the common recognized medium of exchange and were generally considered to represent two dollars fifty cents in value prior to that time the marten or sable skin had generally been treated as the unit and it still after the company's advent retained its position as the common fractional currency it was taken at the company store for a quarter of a dollar in trade and when the prices of the company's goods are considered i think it may safely be said that the company got the best of them both going and coming a piece of soap of a finger's thickness brought four martins or fifty minks for a mink skin was then only worth two cents sea otter skins now seven hundred dollars and more at this time in the company store at fort simpson brought only from ten to twelve dollars in goods which at the ruling prices probably meant all the way from two dollars to four dollars in actual values the food which these indians subsisted upon they largely drew on the sea for true once in a while a deer a mountain goat or a wild fowl would furnish a few meals dried wild berries also at times might be found on the mat there was no table but the staple food year in and year out for old and young was fish salmon and halibut fresh smoked and dried fish roe salmon and herring clams and crabs cuttlefish a great delicacy seaweed and all of it seasoned and enriched by the wonderful ulacan oil when the first of march came the indians of the different tribes at fort simpson broke camp left the houses untenanted and unlocked and came with their families to occupy for a month or two their ancient fishing grounds on the banks of the nas river forty-five miles or so farther north where the waters of the great river tumble over the bar into portland canal they know that this is the time for the ulacan to run up the river and it is important to be at hand at the great event the ulacan or candlefish thalictes pacificus a wonderfully sweet fish to eat when freshly caught is in appearance a good deal like a smelt most of them about twelve to fourteen inches and is said to contain more oil than any other known fish in the frying pan it will melt away like a lump of butter and when dried and provided with a wick it will burn like a candle hence its name between the sixteenth and twentieth of march each year you can see them come by the million yes by the billion up portland canal and hustle over the bar of nass river their great stamping ground at the time we are now interested in their coming furnished a great sight on the banks of the river and in hundreds of canoes near and on the bar from five to eight thousand indians all crying and yelling you are all chiefs every one of you as they attempt to fill their canoes with the shining silvery fish the seagulls by the thousands swinging above the incoming shoals jabbering and chattering moving back and forth up and down all day long further down the spring salmon which are after the ulicans as well as the gulls and the indians jumping out of the water in their mad chase after them again a little further down are lurking the cunning hair seals watching their chance 
and still further away you see the spouting of large finback whales which follow the seals only to be followed in their turn by the orca the killer whale which rip open and disembowel one of these sea monsters in a twinkling of an eye with its fin which is sharp as a razor and this glorious sight and all this incessant battle keeps on for a month or more thousands and thousands of bushels of the little chief fishes are landed and put into wooden kettles which are filled with water made to boil by red-hot stones dropped into the receptacles the grease of the boiling fish floats on top the remainder of the fishes piping hot as they are are scooped up into pine tree root baskets and then the boiling hot mass is pressed against the bare breasts of the women till the grease and every drop of it has been squeezed out the oil must be pressed out in no other way it would shame the fish to treat it otherwise with the precious grease or oil so obtained the indians now return to their homes at fort simpson from where during the early summer months the halibut banks lure the fishermen to obtain a further supply from the ocean storehouse and they are seldom disappointed halibut from seventy five to two hundred fifty pounds greedily snap up their rudely constructed but very effective hooks usually baited with a herring or an ulican when july comes it is off again this time to the old fishing villages on the skeena river where their ancestors for centuries have exercised the privilege of catching the red salmon as it is wriggling its way up to its breeding ground to deposit its spawn here in a few weeks not only all necessary for immediate use but a full supply for the remainder of the year as well as for trading purposes is secured and the whole family now turns its attention towards picking and drying the wild berries growing in abundance along the banks of the river as well as to curing the salmon caught by smoking and drying it for winter use the dry salmon is toasted before the fire like our bread and eaten with ulican oil on a pinch when travelling for instance it can be and is eaten raw i have done so myself and will say that when one is hungry raw dried salmon does not taste badly at all when the new catches in what remains of the old supply is destroyed and never eaten it is then considered out of season then comes in september the great mart of the natives on the beaches near the fort where lieutenant simpson in eighteen forty one says he saw over fourteen thousand indians gathered on the beach and after that is over come the winter festivities as great masters as they show themselves in the trading mart they are greater masters still on the sea in their wonderful canoes hollowed out of a single trunk of one of the red cedar giants growing along the coast with their paddles and sails and nothing else they make these canoes fairly fly over the frothing billows and carry them safely through the roughest gales when many larger crafts with practised mariners furnished with compass and solid steering gear have perished and never been heard from again the indians believe that their fish is just as sensitive as they are as to any offence to its dignity the salmon is a chief and must not be brought in contact with any metal it must only be boiled in their wooden kettles if not it is shamed and may refuse to come back to its usual haunts in eating it they of course use only the heaven-given forks and knives as that will not shame him duncan when first there often witnessed their refusing to sell salmon to the steamer unless the steward would permit them to boil it first in their own wooden kettles the following legend is characteristic of this superstition some boys had shamed a salmon they caught him cut a slit close to his fin and put gravel and stones in the wound so he could not use his fin and then let him out in the stream again the poor fellow wriggled and suffered and could not swim with sand and gravel down his back this made the god of the mountain angry with the people whose children had shamed the salmon and he spewed fire so that it ran down the mountainside and away down into a river where the fire sputtered all around but a god of another mountain near by thought it was too bad so he rolled a big rock and stopped the fire stream the people then came together to consult about what should be done to propitiate the irate mountain god and the salmon as well so he would not go back on them and they came to the conclusion that the naughty children had to be killed 
but when the mothers heard this they raised a rumpus and would not allow the sacrifice the people then compromised by agreeing instead to kill the dogs of the village which were thereupon all sacrificed and burned as a peace offering to the salmon End of chapter nine